Hello, beautiful people. This is Philippa Burgess, and today's video is on data visualization. We regularly find data sets where very often uh, come across visual graphics that are presented to us or that we're asked to create. So today's video is just going to go into some of the basics of data visualization, things that are what I'm going to call data for the rest of us. And so uh, though I am at the beginning of a journey into data analysis and data science, this is really the video that's for the all of us that are just starting to get a better understanding. Maybe we use a little bit of it in our personal and professional lives, but really understanding that this whole data economy has begun and it's coming at us rather quickly. And there's elements that really anybody in any field at any stage of life might want to uh, get a better handle on. And I'm going to explain what it is, why it is, how to break it down really simply. And so let's get going. Uh, let's start with what is data? Data is just the everything that is collected everywhere. So we can, cities are collecting it, satellites are collecting it. When we use our phones, it's being collected. There's all sorts of ways that there's just information and it can be big, it can be small, it can be, you know, even if you just count the days of a week and just and say, this is how many times I did something on Monday, how many times I did it on Tuesday and throughout the week, you're going to just have some data uh, about something. Uh, the next thing we do with data is we sort it and try to sort of find things that go together that match that start to make sense of it. And then we arrange it. And so there's a little bit more structure to it, a little bit more form. And now we're getting into the data visualization. It's presented visually. Now that can be in a bar chart, a pie, um, a line graph, a scatter plot, all sorts of things, a map, um, all the sorts of ways in which that data can be put into pretty pictures. And then it can be explained with a story. And here the example is, you know, now you have a whole house that has uh, a story behind it and that all of the elements brought together give us uh, a, a, a final picture. And that's one way to look at data. I think that that's a little bit overwhelming and I don't think it's as helpful as I would like it to be. And so therefore I'm gonna go the other way. We're gonna start with the story that we want to tell or the story that someone else is telling us. And then we're going to look at how we can either create the visual presentation or how we read someone else's visual presentation. And then based on that, if we need to be the ones creating it or just sort of seeing the validity of what's being presented to us, then we can kind of look a little bit of how it was sorted. Was there bias? Uh, is it Was it really a complete data set? and who created it and why. And so we can kind of look at, you know, where was it sort sorted from? And then we go to the data source itself and to say where, yeah, where was it sourced from? There's mountains of data. So I want to just kind of bring it from why are we using it? What is the point? What are we looking to accomplish? And so I wouldn't be overwhelmed by the whole world of data because I think when you start with data as your first point, it's very overwhelming where to start. And I think then you start Googling it and people are like, well, you need to learn Python or you need to learn SQL or you need to sign up for a certificate program. And you don't. I am here and happy to share with you all of the tools uh, that are super basic and really easy for someone like you're not a data scientist, you're not a data analysis, but something at work or in your life says, hey, can you help me create a pretty picture with these numbers? And so that is what I want to uh, make this really accessible and really easy for everyone. And so it really starts with what story are you trying to tell or what story is trying, someone trying to tell you and how do we just make the pretty pictures or how do we read the pretty pictures to know what uh, is being asked of us and if we agree with it or don't agree with it. Because to say the numbers don't lie is not a fact because numbers can very easily be manipulated and they can have a great amount of bias and it's important that we don't just say because an algorithm lives in a black box that it's a perfect algorithm or that machine learning has learned what it needs to learn without human intervention. 
So therefore, I think it's important that we critically analyze what is presented to us. And also, if we have a story to tell, we know how to find, gather, and present the data in a way that tells the story that we want to tell. Uh, so let's give a basic example of where we all engage in, uh, in data. Uh, if you are on social media, if you have a social media account, you may go on the back end and look for the stats and analytics. You can do this on YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook for business, Instagram, LinkedIn, if you have a Google Ads account. You're going to go on the back end and you're going to look for information that tells you the performance of your activities, uh, how many views, how long they viewed, which videos they viewed, how many likes. Uh, and, and some of this you're working towards monetization or improving monetization. In others, it's just you want the visibility or you want the engagement, you want to grow your followers. So you want to look at trends over time that help to let you know, are you doing a good job? Could you do better? So we all engage in you know, data and these sort of bars and graphs. And when we uh, go on the back end of our social media accounts, it's there. And I'm sure many of us have clicked on analytics. So don't get into the fact that like analytics or, you know, is, is a big math thing. Uh, so no, regardless of your comfort level around math, the idea is that this is accessible for all of us and we all get out of it what we need to get out of it. And uh, I'm just here to add a little bit more uh, understanding, but again, designed for the everyman. And as I'm learning, I will share. So these are the things that I'm seeing. And um, now there's another example of data visualization. Again, they're taking a set of information that exists on, on an Excel sheet, and they're now putting it into a visual representation. So this particular one is looking at the $100 trillion world economy and looking at sort of the strength of the United States relative to China, relative to other countries. Now this is put together by the visual capitalist. It is a great website. It's You can sign up for their free newsletter and I'm gonna make them my unofficial sponsor of this video. So in the link in the bio, uh, I have my link uh, and it, that will get credit if you sign up. So I will be talking more about why I love them, what they do, and it's a great way to start getting more accustomed to what's possible with data visualization. They do a really great job and all sorts of things that they look at about how our world is and give us different ways to think about it than we might just if we saw the information just on an Excel sheet. We we'll also wanna to talk to you about the fact that as many of you know, if you've uh, watched my other videos, that not only am I a USC alumni for my undergraduate, but I'm now completing my master's in urban and regional planning, and I'm continuing on with data science and GIS. So I'm actually starting my seventh year as a USC student. And that is one of the reasons why I've committed to being a content creator, because I'm like, I don't know what else I can do professionally that's going to allow me the time to be a student first and then use all the cool things I'm learning to share with you here on YouTube and build my community. And this channel is really dedicated to reviews of things that I find helpful uh, and then also come learn with me. What I want to say is that in 2000, no, where were we at? No, actually back to 19, 1993, AOL was everywhere. It was the beginning of email. It was a major shift in technology and people's access to technology and, and you know, who is going to go into the future and who is going to get left behind and then who would have to play catch up. And AOL, it, you know, it was the beginning of email and the sort of whole sort of digital economy that we now have. And in 2007, we had the beginning of Facebook. And that also was another shift in how we engaged, how we communicated, and those who early adopted and those who eventually had to catch up and say, oh, you know, this applies to me too. And so this is not about being a social media manager or making social media your profession. At a certain point, you could be a mid-level manager at any company and social media applied to you, or even in your personal life, social media applied to you. So now we had email and social media. So what I want to say is that all the students who are getting their undergraduate degrees uh, from places like USC and many other institutions are now having data 
data science, data visualization embedded into their academic programs. So as I was signing up for my uh, fall classes, I went and looked around the entire university at all of the classes that were being offered in all of the departments. And it came to my attention that all of them, not all of them, but many majors that you would not expect to see perhaps a data science or data visualization class had data as part of the curriculum. So what that tells us is people that are graduating from college, this is now part of their language and part of their skill set. And I'm here to play catch up for the rest of us. And let's, I, I graduated with a minor in, sorry, a major in international relations and a minor in film. Um, and I can tell you that in international relations, we did not at the time that I graduated two decades ago from my undergraduate have an applied data science for international relations class. That's, uh, that's definitely was not there. And that's been added to the curriculum because now it is relevant. Um, public relations, which is communication, a very soft skill uh, has social media analytics, data and content creation for real time public relations. We've got, they've also got storytelling with data intelligence, which is what we're looking at in this video. Uh, they've got analytics for health innovators, probability and statistics for economists, big data econometrics, economic applications of machine learning, applied statistics and data analysis in criminal justice, uh, practical analysis of biology data in R, which is one of the programs which, uh, again, you can go really big and really deep and like make it your entire life work, or you can just get in and out, get what you need. It's a free software and it, the, it is quite useful, especially in making heat maps and graphs. And I'm just gonna give you guys all the basics that you need to make it your friend. And again, what I'm talking about is R for everyone and visualization and data for everyone. So really wanna help you kind of get in, get out, get what you need. Um, we also have it in the program that I'm just completing, which is urban planning. We took the class communicating data for planning and development and big data for planning and development. I love those classes. That's where I kind of completely fell in love with this and was like, I'm, I'm, I want to dive into the deep end of the pool here. And I want to bring everybody with me and help everybody not only swim, but really enjoy the pool and really thrive and, and be prepared for this ne next, what I would call epoch in our uh, society and our use of technology. And like I said, this wave is already here and I just want to make sure none of us are left behind, uh, with that. Um, so then also, well, obviously math is going to have, um, this kind of information. So you've got uh, statistical consulting and data analysis, and then in architecture, it's visual storytelling and entrepreneurship in media and accounting, uh, tax data analytics. So again, we're seeing this is embedded into all types of majors, uh, not just the data science uh, curriculum as a data science student or computer science. So now I wanna bring you into three famous visualizations. You may or may not have seen these before. I know some of them were new to me and they were introduced to me uh, through the courses that I took. And I think anybody who, as we start to have more language and understanding around data, should get familiar with Jon Snow, uh, who did um, his work in 1854, Charles Joseph Menard in 1869, and W.E.B. Du Bois in 1900. If you know these people, you're, you're ahead. Uh, if you don't, we're going to introduce them to you now uh, because they are just, you'll understand why they're famous. But they also give us the insight that data visualization can be done by hand. Um, so it's great that we have all of these great technology tools, all these great software, all of these things that make it really easy for us, uh, though there's a, maybe a learning curve or knowing which tools to use when and for what. Um, but these people really started their process of data visualization because they had a story they wanted to tell and they you know, took pen to paper to tell it uh, in visual ways that were very efficient. And so Jon Snow was... a uh, looking at the cholera outbreak in London. And so he mapped the area and then he started making notes of where the cases were. And so each of the black marks, of which there's the close up on the right, is, a, is where he was getting a, a case. And so as a doctor, he was trying to understand 
what was the source of this illness and could anything about where this illness was showing up inform uh, finding a solution? You know, what was causing this outbreak of cholera? And it ultimately was sourced to the water supply. And he could tell that by the location of the outbreak. And so this map was very important and informative in helping him uncover uh, what was, you know, what was the source of this cholera outbreak. And so this is one of kind of the early uh, data visualizations, or he's sort of referred to as sort of the father of data visualization, because this was an example of um, putting a map and putting some information on that map to help us solve problems and help us make decisions. And in this case, get to the source of what was causing this outbreak and this illness and therefore fix it so that nobody else would get sick. Uh, the next one, uh, and this is particularly relevant as we've got the current Russian invasion of Ukraine, but historically, uh, Napoleon had also invaded Moscow. And so this particular graphic is referred to as just kind of the most famous data visualization. Uh, and honestly, I had not seen it before I took my data visualization class at school. And what it is, is on the left side, you've got uh, Paris and Napoleon uh, heading east. And you've got the number of soldiers that are in beige marching to Moscow. And so it is very specific in terms of the number of troops that left uh, Paris and the date and when they left, and then all the way continuing their march to when they got to Moscow and how many of them, you know, sort of what kind of attrition had happened along the way. And then the black coming from uh, east to west, or in here, in this case, right to left, is how many troops returned and the fact that there was, you know, even more attrition from those who survived the battle on their march back to Paris. And it's obviously often referred to as Napoleon's disastrous invasion of Moscow. Uh, and my takeaway also from war and peace is that Americans have translated the word mere as peace, but it really means world. And when you look at it, it's a little bit more a kind of a world domination view. So in 1986, when the Russians had named their space station Mir, America sim simply translated it as peace, where really what it meant was uh, peace after kind of Russia domination. And um, Moscow is particularly vulnerable. And therefore, the conclusion that war and peace, which is basically the story uh, told from the Russian perspective, uh, makes is that Russia wins war when soldiers feel like they're one defending their territory and to have and keep up morale. And so I think those lessons are equally as relevant to us today when we look at the Russian invasion, that a lot of the propaganda, a lot of the messaging for Russians is you are defending your homeland, even though from a US, European and Ukrainian perspective, they are the occupiers and invaders. But you know, from the Russian point of view, they really go with what Leo Tolstoy had said about it, which was, uh, they need to know that and feel like they're the heroes, they're the defenders. And as long as they keep up morale, they have a fighting chance and that's why they're in the stalemate that they are. But if that morale were to decline, that would more signify the end of Russian uh, ambitions. So they very much in this war, current conflict, uh, are very much uh, needing to keep up uh, that morale and that narrative that they are defending their homeland. Um, so that is the story of War and Peace, and that is the story of this infographic. Now, this infographic has so much information in it, and not only in terms of the number of troops, but also the temperatures, because some of this was a winter campaign. And, you know, that was part of, you know, so at the very bottom of the graph, they're also showing what types of temperatures um, these troops were experiencing and sort of the dates. And so there's just a lot in here and it's just rich for data visualization and something that is considered one of the most significant data visualizations out there. And now I'm gonna bring it to uh, W.E.B. Dubois and he used data visualization to uh, share certain realities um, of the, the black Negro 
experience in the United States. And he was invited to Paris at the 1900 World Fair. Uh, and he had created with a whole team, many, many visualizations of communicating uh, the black experience at the time. And so this particular one is looking at slaves and free Negroes um, by year, kind of who kind of was still enslaved and who had gained their freedom up until the point where everybody had gained their freedom. And so he has a very powerful series of looking at um, black history uh, through data visualizations and something I feel strongly that we all should be familiar with. And so if you just Google W.E.B. Du Bois images, uh, a lot of his famous ones will show up. And of course, there's many books that have been written and published uh, with these designs as well. Now, let's bring a modern example. So there's a great book uh, by uh, Georgia Lupi and Stephanie Posovec. And they are just people who love data and love data visualizations. And they corresponded with each other as pen pals um, sharing their various data visualizations. So again, back to the pen and paper of data visualization. And it's a great book. And they basically, uh, through a series of postcards, uh, shared things that they were tracking in their life and seeing how uh, data showed up in everyday life. So here are just a few examples of these postcards that they shared with everybody. And they it could be... Uh, around eating, it could be around exercise, it could be about work, it could be around, you know, the number of times their boyfriend annoyed them with something. They really took anything that they could count and uh, put it into a visualization that they then shared with each other and ultimately got published into this book called Dear Data. And worth checking out again, even if you just look at it on the internet, it's a really just a feast of ways that data can be visualized and communicated. And it's a lot of fun. And just again, wanting to make this easy and accessible for, again, data for the rest of us. Now I wanna talk about 10 ways we interact with data visualizations, whether we want to or not. These are just the ways that they are part of our life and ways that we um, can you know, sort of up our game uh, as it relates to this. And I am going to make individual videos about each of these topics, but this is meant to be an overview of the 10 ways we interact with data visualizations. Um, and I'm gonna start with number 10. Again, starting from the house, the story, so to speak. Um, visualization used as evidence. It is used to convince you of something, whether that is fact or fiction, whether it's benevolent or nefarious, uh, you are presented with data visualizations every single day when you read the internet, you read an article, you read the newspaper, uh, you read marketing material. They're going to insert some kind of graph, some kind of data point that is designed to make you go, oh, okay, the data proves that this might be true. And I, and it, a lot of it is really designed to get even an unconscious emotional response from you because you see something and you're either compelled and convinced, like, wow, this is this is good, or you're compelled and convinced, uh, oh, this is really bad, we shouldn't do that, I don't like this. And to be aware of where it falls into the idea of, I would say propaganda, is if it really is designed to give you an oversized emotional response to something. Uh, a lot of times that that is data that has been manipulated and the story is not really based on uh, a neutral opinion, but more like it's been crafted and designed and certain things were taken to prove a point kind of maybe in an oversized manner. But every day we see and interact with all sorts of data visualizations in our personal life, in our professional life, in news media. And so what I would task you to do is just start to be aware of everywhere you see a data visualization and understand that that's what it is. It could be a graph, it could be a pie chart, it could be dots, it could be uh, you know, number versus number. Uh, there's all sorts of ways that it's presented, but just one thing is just start to be aware of everywhere that you're starting to see these visualizations in your life and I guarantee you, you will start to see them everywhere. 
The next thing is understanding a visualization. Now, separate of those that we just kind of encounter through media, and we just take a, a, you know, sort of we don't even sometimes even acknowledge that we've read it and processed it. There's ones that you see and you actually want to take a closer look at, and I'll call that the quick study. Now you've sort of presented with something and you're going to kind of read the X axis and the Y axis, you know, and see what's in the middle of it and what it's trying to tell you. You'll read the, the, the description and you'll read kind of what's maybe written or presented around it. And you'll start to say, okay, I see where this is sourced from. I see what they're trying to say. I see how they've presented the numbers. And I'll just kind of refer to that as a quick study. You want to know a bit more and you're just, giving it a little bit more time and attention to see what it's really trying to tell you, what it's about. Again, kind of what we'll refer to as the quick study. The number eight is now something where you take more time to review and conclude. So if I'm using social media stats, a quick study would be just going into the back end as they present the data, and just say, how am I doing this week? How am I doing this month? Okay, that's just like a quick review. You know, either things are slowing down or things are going in the right direction. That's the kind of the quick and dirty version of that. A review and conclude would be, maybe I have an objective, like I'm trying to monetize. I wanna get to uh, a certain uh, goal. And so for example, like on TikTok, I'm a TikTok creator. I am looking to get to that 10,000. And then on my way to 10,000, I may, uh, feel that I'm like, okay, I'm noticing that month over month, I have a pretty consistent uh, follower count. And I just do certain things that kind of keep me moving steadily. And I have a pretty, if things continue along that same track, I have a pretty good idea of when my account might be monetized. Um, and so I can download that data. I can put that data in, they give it to me as a CSV or an Excel file. So a comma value limited file, which is like, it's a single sheet Excel uh, type of file. And I can sort of start organizing the columns. I can look at stuff and I can even do some very basic, super simple, happy to show you how to do it if you don't know how to do it, uh, calculations where I start looking at the um, percentages. So I notice like I can ask like, hey, are some of these videos being suppressed? Or what is my average um, like versus view? Like how much is the algorithm sharing my video relative to how many times people have showed that they like the video. And I had one that had us, you know, most of mine were showing up around three to 5%, uh, some at seven, some at 10, but then I had one video that was coming in at 17%. And I was like, okay, that shows me that that, that video feels really suppressed for the number of people who liked it relative to how many, how much it's, it's going out in the algorithm. And so it helped me make some conclusions of types of content that the algorithm is going to be more friendly to versus types of content that it's going to perhaps actively suppress. And that I just found that was informative and I could actually then make some choices and decisions as I look to create my content strategy going forward because I'm dealing with an algorithm and I need to understand kind of how it works. And again, so review and conclude is where you have a question, you really want to sort of look at the data in simple ways and uh, come up with some answers. I've also done this with my stock market portfolio where I'll download the file from TD Ameritrade and I can do all sorts of calculations that just kind of help me get a better understanding of my trades, where I'm winning, where I'm losing. And it just it's super helpful for me to understand what kind of decisions I'm making and how I could perhaps make better decisions. And most of these calculations are done in the Excel file themselves, super simple. And again, I'll be making videos and uh, helping to sort of show how I do this and answer any of your questions. And just again, show basic ways of how we simply can review and conclude, which then comes back to the next thing we'll do with the, uh, is the sharing of a visualization. Now, perhaps we now have um, something that we've seen, someone else has created, but it's our task to communicate it and to make sure that we have enough understanding of what's going on in that visualization, that if we were asked to have a discussion about it, we can do that. We know how the language and we know the thinking and we know how it was kind of put together, that we have what we need to communicate it. Uh, and then I kind of go to another level, which is present. And presenting is a little bit more formal. Now it is, you're including it in a report, you're including it in, uh, 
a slide presentation on a Zoom meeting at a live event, you are presenting this data. So you need, this is more than just even communicating it. You're kind of owning it and saying, this is what you know our team or myself or whoever it is that kind of created and got to this conclusion. And you have sort of an ownership of what it is that you can answer any question that comes to you while other people are actually looking at this particular visualization. And you have like a real command of what's there, why it's there, and what kind of questions might have been asked before they got there, and why this particular visualization matters. Uh, now we'll get to the data meets the visualization. So all of the other stuff you are basically really dealing with output. Um, now we're kind of at the middle um, and at sort of place five, we're at create. How are we creating a visualization? And this is understanding before we get into like the wide world of all of the technologies and the softwares and the skills and all of that stuff, I think a big part of it is understanding what are you creating it for? Because some of it can be super fast, super simple, really easy to do. There's so many tools out there. Um, other ones are already made for you and you just need to know where to go look for them and source them. And I'm going to be um, doing videos about places like Tableau Public. And so you can see like what other people have already created and you can borrow them, share them, you know, kindly credit them. But a lot of stuff has already either been created or again, there's easy ways for you to create it. You can create a graph in Canva. So that's a, a great, another tool. I'm gonna do a series of videos just on digital tools that I use um, for everything, for uh, making videos, for doing digital marketing, uh, for, um, you know, in my urban planning and in my uh, data science life. But Canva is a really great tool. You just plug in some numbers. Uh, you can create visualizations within Excel. And if you don't know how to do that, happy to show you how to do that. Uh, I know myself, I need to sort of up level even some of my skills in that area. But it's very, if you know how to use Excel, even at a basic level, it's very manageable, you know, that we can, we can learn that together and get good at uh, doing things within Excel. Our studio, again, there, there's a whole world of it, but I'm just going to take you into the shallow end on that one. And you can get in and out of it really quick to get things you need. We can show you how to create heat maps, um, you know, bar graphs, scatter plots, and how to sort of ask questions. Uh, but that's a little bit more. Right now, we're just sort of saying you have a data set, you kind of know what you want to say, and you are just like, how do I make this visualization? So there's a bunch of tools for that, and we'll get into that. But just know that if you want to create or find visualizations, it's data for the rest of us. It's it's not as hard as you think, and it can be done uh, relatively, uh, you know, with a pretty low bar to entry. Um, next, um, and this gets where it's a little bit more, um, is where you start to do data sorting and exploring. And that's what I love about data is that it's a little bit like a magic eight ball you can compare things, you can ask it questions, you in the sort of fourth thing we're talking about, you can test and analyze it. And you can say, does this correlate to this? Did this cause that? Uh, you can look at causation, you can look at, you know, sort of all sorts of things that just you ask it questions, and it delivers you answers. And that's why I said a lot of times it can kind of be manipulated, because they'll look for the thing that has the strongest correlation, but they failed to sort of give you other things that perhaps didn't have the same wow factor. And so there's a lot that goes kind of behind the scenes. Uh, and now this is, again, where we're just really working mostly through uh, the original data file, which are usually like Excel files that are then sort of or CSV files, which are ported somewhere. And you can then um, and in those steps, you know, so that there's the test and analyze this. You have data. So you can take multiple data sets and you can kind of create you know, one master that has all the information that you want. And then, um, and that's where you test and analyze. But before you do that, you need to organize the information. So let's say you wanted to take census data information and Bureau of Labor Statistics information and some environmental uh, pollution information and like, put it all together into one matched clean uh, Excel file that uh, you can then sort of start your test and analyze from. And before you organize it, the step that comes before that is you do need to import it and tidy it. 
So get it to do the work, you know, make sure that it's uh, able to be processed by whatever software or tool that you're using. And so that step is the import and tidy. And that's where um, perhaps, you know, having a few more uh, data analysis skills gives you more tools to do that with. But again, I can take everybody into the shallow end of the pool here on that one and show you, you know, where to start uh, for whatever goal it is that you have in mind. Uh, you know, once you know that you're not there to do all of data, you're just like, oh, I have a presentation and I need to make this particular point and I want to source this particular data to do that. You know, then, like I said, it, these steps can be easily achieved. And then the final thing is finding and qualifying the data, understanding what the source of the data is. Now, there are cer certain like cities right now have open data. You can just go and find everything. The federal government has data. Uh, so that like there's satellite data, there's, uh, there's just literally tens of thousands of sources of data set. And I'm also going to sort of show you where you can find these data sets. Uh, most of them are free. A couple of them you do have to sort of register an email and some of them you need an API code uh, to plug into other ones, you know, you can just download the Excel file. And some of them are really big files. So that's where knowing how to tidy them, import them, you know, get them set up helps. But we just want to find like, and then you want to qualify the source of the data. How frequently was the data collected? Um, how large of a sample size? And who was in the sample size? And so there's questions to really understand the validity of the data. Was it biased in its sourcing? Was it thorough and complete in its sourcing? Uh, what time period does it cover? Were there intervals between you know, the time that it was collected? So all sorts of information that you just want to ask about sourcing the data and where you can go look for these data sets. And again, there are tens of thousands out there, but in my dedicated video on the subject, I will introduce you to a few hundred and you can start to see the ones that are most relevant to the fields uh, or personal interest that you have. So that brings me back to Visual Capitalist. It's a great place to start, to start getting your mind around data visualizations. They do great ones and they have a daily free email. So please use the uh, link in my bio to sign up for your free Visual Capitalist uh, daily email where you can start to see really cool data visualizations and what's possible in telling the stories that you want to tell. And also, again, just getting a better understanding of which ones feel uh, relevant and compelling to you versus which ones you may even question and be like, hmm, I don't know about that one. And that's good. It's having those critical analysis skills uh, not only matters now, but will matter even more in the future. So I do invite you to check out Visual Capitalist. They are my unofficial sponsor of this video. And I think they just do a really great job of data visualization and helping us all become more literate in that. Um, and then I get cool prizes for uh, from Visual Capitalist in their referral program. So I'll get a thank you from the CEO if I get uh, one subscriber all the way to uh, they'll make us our own data visualization if I get a thousand. So I just, again, please, uh, as I'm building my channel, it's kind of fun ways for me to play and see who's watching my videos and how I can help. I invite your comments to uh, tell me what more things you'd like to learn. Uh, I uh, have definitely looked at a, a number of different data science programs. And one, for example, at CU Boulder had basically said, oh, you want to be in our data science program? Well, we have a calculus uh, and uh, probability statistics, um, linear algebra prerequisite before you can even apply. So one of the things I'm going to be doing as I'm studying data science, now I'm going to be in the USC program, uh, which is a little bit more focused on GIS uh, as far as like geographic information systems and mapping. But there's a technology piece. And so I will kind of ha still have all the foundations. So I'm currently going through Khan Academy, Allison, LinkedIn Learning to brush up on those skills and to learn things that I've not learned before. And within my channel, I want to invite you to come learn with me, um, especially if you're at any way math afraid. I will be there with you every step of the way. I uh, not only love math, but I also um, I think I can kind of get you wherever you need to go with it. And, and my 
primary thing is if you don't like it, it usually has nothing to do with you. It has a lot to do with you never had good teachers. So I think one thing is just restoring your own confidence and in that it's uh, maybe not as painful or scary as you uh, were taught when you were younger and that whatever it is that we need to learn, we can learn it together. So I'm here for that and just thank you. Um, I, if you like this video, please give it a like. Uh, subscribe to my channel and uh, get into my comments with things that you'd like to learn and uh, look for the next series of videos, which again is going to take those 10 steps and do a deeper dive into each one of them. I look forward to seeing you again for the next video and getting to know you as, and welcoming you to my community uh, where we can learn data together. And this is again, data for the rest of us because it's coming. And we not only want to, we want to be on the front foot and not caught on the back foot when this language and this skill set really becomes something that our society is just going to, everybody's going to need a certain fluency uh, in it and really understanding what it is, what it isn't. And no, you don't need to learn Python and no, you don't need to learn, um, you know, sort of the, the everything that goes into someone who's going to have this as their profession but everybody should be know how to read uh, a, a data visualization and understand algorithms and machine learning because we interface with them in the ways that, whether we're doing social media or all sorts of ways, we should know where they're being used in our society. Uh, and especially like they fall into these black boxes where um, a lot of it's like, oh, it's proprietary. We can't tell you how the black box works, but it also in a lot of ways furthers inequality and there are some challenges that we, we, again, as a society need to be aware of that these are not perfect systems and we need to call them out uh, when they're not working. One of the books that we uh, read that I also do a review on uh, was called Weapons of Math Destruction. And that's math, M-A-T-H. And it just talks about, you know, yeah, we do not just need to trust the algorithm or the black box or data without giving it um, a real understanding of what it is doing and how we are interacting with it. And so yeah, there's a lot more to discuss. I'm so happy that you're here. If you made it to the end of this video, I just really appreciate you as I grow and build this channel and I'm excited for what's to come and uh, being a part of this journey with you.